couple of things, uh, housekeeping things as we get started. First of all, I've got some handouts for you. Uh, but I also, let's see, since we've only got this week, and Anna should be back, Dr. Vincenti should be back next week, a week from today. Uh, I would like you to read, and you've already done a lot, uh, I'd like you to read the rest between, so if you get it done Wednesday, great. If it's not done until Friday, that's fine as well. But basically, I, I'd like you to finish off this section we have called The American Founding by Friday. You do not need to read the Kentucky or the counter-resolutions. But every, or, and you don't need to read the letter of Thomas Jefferson to Robert Livingston. But if you could read through the other things that we have there. The Declaration of the Rights of Man and of Citizen, uh, Washington's First Inaugural Selections from Edmund Burke, Robespierre, Washington again, and then Thomas Jefferson's first inaugural, and that piece, which is kind of fun, The Pleasures of Agriculture. I don't know if we'll get through all that, but I would like you to have read that for at least by Friday. If you could do half of it for Wednesday, that would be great. But no worries if not. I think what I'm going to do, a lot's going to depend on how far we get today, but I think what I'll probably do is talk about Washington and Jefferson on Wednesday, and then on Friday we'll look at the French Revolution and compare republicanisms, French republicanism versus American republicanism. Okay, one other thing, just a housekeeping thing, uh, before I hand out these, these sheets, I also have, uh, as you may have noticed, I've recorded everything we've done in here, and I just put those on YouTube. So it's a public YouTube channel. If you just type in Brad Berzer at YouTube, the last three posts that I have, will be our last three classes, and I'll do that this week as well. So uh, obviously these are unusual circumstances since I'm not your normal teacher, um, your normal prof, but hopefully it'll help you as well, and maybe that'll help uh, Dr. Vincenzi know where I went uh, to. Okay, so I've got two handouts here. Uh, the first handout is just a, a summation. I didn't feel like I gave you guys enough on Friday, and I was so, so tired and kind of out of it on Friday, but I didn't feel like I gave you guys enough on uh, at least an outline of what was going on with the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. So there's a, at least this is something I put together that will help somewhat I try to outline what the main arguments were by both the, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. So I've given you some quotes there from things that were not. Okay, how many do we need? Just one? one. Yeah. Brianna, did you yeah. So everybody has one? Great. Okay. So just to give you a sense there of what the main Federalist arguments were and what the main anti-Federalist arguments were. So I gave you mostly from Federalist uh, 39, which was one that you had, but then I also have some from 70 and 37, as you can see there. And on the, the other side of the page, I've got the anti-Federalist arguments and with a number of quotes from a variety of different anti-federalist writings. Okay, the other thing that I want to go over, and this is what we'll do today, is we're going to talk about a really nasty subject, but one that we have to talk about, uh, slavery. And I want to try and figure out why slavery develops the way that it does in American history. So I, I was hoping, I don't know how to do it with Zoom. I actually had some maps to show you, but I didn't know how to do it with the Zoom thing working. And I didn't have time to figure it out. So I thought what I would just do is uh, put the map here on the sheet. And hopefully it's in good enough shape that you guys can see it somewhat. Uh, and I'll talk about it, what that map signifies and what's going on there. Okay. So any more? Yeah. Two more? Just one. Just one. How about back here? Me too, still? Definitely not person. Okay, good. Everybody's got one? All right. So we'll go over that in just a second. So if you remember, one of the persons that I mentioned as a Federalist, if you read the letters of the was a very important guy. He also wrote the article of Confederation, a guy by the name of John Dickinson. And one of the things we can say about the American founding is that Dickinson was certainly one of the most important figures 
in the constitutional debates. So Madison was very young, brilliant, absolutely brilliant, uh, and was always trying to kind of innovate. Here's what we could do. Here's what we should do. Uh, let's try this. And Dickinson was always his foil, and they made a great team, even though they're constantly arguing with each other. Dickinson always says, you've got to show me in history where it's happened before if we're going to try it. So there shouldn't be anything from the time that we give to the senators to the kinds of checks and balances. If you can't show me somewhere in history where this has been tried, then it's not our job to innovate. In fact, we've been told through the Constitution what we're doing with the Constitution. We've been told that all we're supposed to do is amend the Articles of Confederation. It's not our job, nor should it be, just to make something up and think, oh, well, that looks great on paper, and therefore it's going to work. So Dickinson constantly is challenging Madison. Madison comes up with a brilliant idea, and Dickinson says, it's fine. Now show me where in an ancient republic that was done. Show me in Greece. Show me in Rome. Show me in Carthage. Just somewhere, show me how this worked. And because Dickinson believed very strongly, and did Madison, but again, Madison's innovating so much, Dickinson believed so strongly that human nature is the same. And it doesn't matter if we're in the ancient world or the modern world, we have to be very careful about this. So probably his most famous statement was a statement he gave on August 13th. And this is in the middle of the debates, of course, about the Constitution during that summer of 1787. And Dickinson says, we've got to figure out what the response will be. That is, how are we going to understand what we're creating here, what really matters? And it was during the debates on slavery, which start on August 8th. And here's what Dickinson says. He says, experience must be our only guide. Reason may mislead us. It was not reason that discovered the singular and admirable mechanism of the English Constitution. Uh, no one wrote down the English Constitution. No one in it created it. It was one of those things that developed over time. And the same, if you guys remember back to your Western heritage, the same thing was true with the Roman Republic. The Roman Republic was declared in 509 BC, but it only had a Senate at first, and then it evolved so that it also had you know, an equivalent of the House of Representatives, it had the people, and then it had the tribunes and the consuls. But all of these things were innovations over time. No one sat down and, and wrote the thing. And so Dickinson is telling us, we have to remember that the best constitutions were not written but evolve slowly over time, that is through trial and error. So again, experience must be our only, reason, uh, our only guide, for reason may mislead us. It was not reason that discovered the singular and admirable mechanism of the English Constitution. It was not reason that discovered or ever could have discovered the odd and the eye of those who were governed by reason, that absurd mode of trial by jury. Remember when we talked about this with common law, we have no idea where a trial by jury came from. We only know that when Christian missionaries showed up to the Anglo-Saxons, it was already an institution that was in use, and it was a very powerful institution. And Dickinson is not mocking it. He's doing quite the opposite. How would we have ever come across this thing except to say it was already written deeply in our own DNA? Accidents probably produced these discoveries, and experience gave sanction to them. This, then, must be our only guide. So we can be as theoretical as we want about things, but we still have to show where this thing happened or where it didn't in history, making allowance for the fact that some things, like a trial by jury, simply came really out of nowhere, and therefore we have to be able to account for that. Okay, well this comes during the middle of a very, very contentious debate, a debate on slavery, and whether slavery will be implemented in what's now the United States and furthered by the Constitution or abolished by the Constitution. So don't forget that when we talked about the Old Northwest Territory, remember on July 13th of 1787, they unanimously voted to abolish all slavery in the territories. So there could be no slavery in Ohio or Indiana or Michigan or Wisconsin or Illinois, right? N not. Now, it doesn't deal with other places. So when Arkansas comes into the Union, what's going to happen there? And nobody really quite knows, but they know that when they pass this bill dealing with this territory where we are right now, they know that there's going to be no slavery. 
So remember, as I talked about last week, whenever the founders talk about the West, they're talking about the future of the Republic because this is the direction we're heading in. We're moving West and therefore whatever we decide about what's on the frontier and what's West is really a definition about the future of the Republic itself. So it seems to be the case, at least according to one half of the founding, it seems to be the case that in, in New York in 1787 in Congress, those founders were adamantly opposed to slavery being extended. Now, nobody talks about slavery being abolished where it now is. They only talk about it not being extended into the territories into which we're moving. So it's not going to abolish slavery in Georgia, but it is going to prevent slavery from going into the Western territories. At least that's the argument. So that was July 13th of 1787. On August 8th of 1787, so less than a month later, the Constitutional Convention takes up this question. And I, I have to show you guys this. I hope, I know you don't know me very well. You're just going to have to trust me that I'm not a really volatile guy. I'm fairly calm most of the time. I'm going to get excited about stuff, but I don't get angry very easily. Uh, I really don't have much of a temper. But if you look at my book, I can take out an entire section of it. And I usually treat my books really well. And this is because I was at a conference a little over 10 years ago, and I'm almost somewhat embarrassed to admit this, but at least you'll understand uh, the strength of feeling here. Uh, well, okay, let me, let me jump back a little bit. So when I was in high school, I was an overnight DJ at a local rock station. So I did that during the summers, which was great. It was one of the best jobs I've ever had. But this is how nerdy I was. I read Madison's notes at night in between songs and commercial breaks. So I read through this, but I was, uh, I was in high school at the time, and I didn't reread all of these. And this is just volume two. So the debates are, are rather long, very involved. So there's volume one, volume two of the debates from May all the way up until September. And I was reading this debate on slavery, and I, I hadn't remembered. I mean, it had been 20 years earlier since I'd read it the first time. I had not remembered how intense the debate is. And it's incredible. One of the things, I think for those of us who love the founding, and I absolutely love the founding, but I think for those of us who love the founding, we either want not to talk about slavery because it's such a bizarre point that goes against everything they believed, or we kind of say, well, they're men of their times. Of course they're going to, they're going to have slavery right? because that's who they are. When you read the debates, you know both of those things are lies. Number one, these guys know exactly what they're doing. I mean, absolutely exactly what they're doing. And when they make the decision in favor of slavery, they do so for the reason that they believe that the nation demands it as a whole, rather than it being good in and of itself. In other words, they put aside the morality and the ethics of the institution. And rather than losing Georgia and South Carolina, which is what would have happened if they had abolished slavery, Georgia and South Carolina would have been out of the union. Then we would have been 11 states. But rather than doing that, they decide to allow slavery in three different parts. And here, here's why my book is broken. At the end of this debate, one of the representatives from South Carolina stands up and he says, let us always remember, religion and humanity have nothing to do with this question. It is interest alone that is the governing principle of nations. I hope you guys get the implications of that. There are no moral or ethical decisions being made here. We put that all aside and we allow this thing to go because it's in the best interest of the country as a whole. In other words, they're making a very calculated debate, not a debate based on morality or ethics. And I will admit, I was in a hotel room in Philadelphia when I was reading this and I took my book and I threw it against the wall. It didn't damage the wall. I would have paid for it if I damaged the wall. But I definitely damaged my book. I was so upset <laughs> because it's not the founding I want. Right? And that's, that's not fair as a historian. I have to take what I find. But it is absolutely not the founding <coughs> that we wish when we think of the life of rights, uh, the rights of man of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It, it doesn't fit. And they know that. So here's what I want us to do today. I want us to think about this issue of slavery and how it plays out in America. And, and it has a very weird history. So if you notice on the sheet that I gave you, I have the one side 
which is just simply called American Heritage Slavery. And I've given you some terms that I think you ought to know, and I'll give this to Dr. Vincenci as well, uh, and, and she can do with, with it what she wants, obviously, since it's her class. But these are terms that I, if I were your professor this semester, these are ones that I would expect you to know from the issue of slavery itself. So what an indentured servant is, chattel slavery, and the difference I'll talk about, indentured servitude is when you sell yourself into a period of servitude, but not forever by any means. Chattel slavery, though, means that if I'm a slave owner, I not only own you for your entire life, I own all of your children and grandchildren and their grandchildren and their grandchildren and so forth all the way down the line. So chattel slavery means that I control your actual line of existence as far as possible. So that's the difference between indentured servitude and chattel slavery. And then I'll, I'll talk here uh, in a moment about the slave coast and the triangular trade. So slavery has this really weird history in America. The very first blacks who arrive on American soil do so in 1619, and they arrive in Jamestown. Jamestown is this odd place because it's all male up until 1619. It's founded roughly 12 years earlier, but there are no women at all in Jamestown. It's completely a male enterprise, which means it's not really a community. You guys, we don't have to go into Bio 101, you know why. That's not a community. It's not until 1619 that the first women arrive in Jamestown. It's also the first time that Africans arrive in Jamestown. And they're brought on a Dutch man of war ship. So the Dutch are transporting these enslaved blacks. And when the Virginians buy them, which they do, when they buy them in 1619, they do not buy them as slaves. I can't stress that enough. They buy them as indentured servants meaning that all Africans who arrive in the New World between 1619 and a half century later, 1669, are always forced indentured servants. So it's not at all atypical for whites, poor whites in places like England to sell themselves into indentured servitude because what that means is they would then have their way paid for across the Atlantic and they would have their first six to seven years taken care of but of course they would be in servitude to somebody else. But at the end of the seven years, and this is from the Old Testament from the Jubilee, at the end of the seven years, you're released and you're freed. And that's exactly what happened with Africans for the first 50 years. They're taken against their will, don't get me wrong. No African volunteers for this, but they're taken against their will and they are then sold into indentured servitude, meaning that they have to pay off their passage for seven years, and then they're freed and almost always given land. And so if any of you studied the American Civil War, there's always this kind of odd thing where in the South, you have four million enslaved blacks and you have a quarter million free blacks. And that's, that's wild when you think, wait a minute, we tend to think that everybody who's black has to be enslaved in the South. Well, the vast majority are. But that quarter of a million free blacks those are the people who had been freed prior to this law going into these laws going into effect around 1669. So they're the descendants of these very first Africans who were brought over, and they they are not re-enslaved. They remain free during that time period. So just keep that in mind. So what is this slave trade? And hopefully you can kind of see on the map here. I realize it's not great. I apologize. That yeah. You guys have better eyes than I do, I'm sure, but it's still hard to read. So the slave trade is an incredibly old trade. It's possibly the oldest trade that we know of in terms of international relations, except for spices. Spices are always going to be traded all the time, and that spices make make the trade, the international trade, for a long time. It's what prompts people to explore and so forth. But slavery would be probably number two in terms of what's being traded. And you have to understand an old mentality, and please, I hope you guys know, 
I'm not, in no way am I trying to justify any of this. I'm just trying to explain how they thought about it. So prior to Adam Smith writing his great book on the inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations, which comes out in 1776, prior to that book, there had been a reigning theory called mercantilism. And mercantilism is based on a lot of different ideas, but it essentially assumes that all resources are static. That's the, the main part of mercantilism, is that all resources are static. So that, and it, the easiest example would be, and I, I, this is obviously an exaggeration, but let's say there's a thousand tons of gold in the world total. Right? That's it. There's a thousand tons. Well, if the Spanish get a hold of 600 tons, that means everybody else has to split the remaining 400. And that's how mercantilism works. They don't understand that trade actually increases goods. They think that there is a set amount of goods in the world, and that's all. And the same thing is true for labor. Just as a country would do everything possible to gain as much gold as possible so no one else could have it, the same thing they thought was true with labor. You grab as much labor as possible in order to make sure that you have secured that resource. So under mercantilism, people are not ends in and of themselves. They're means to another end, right? And that, that's one of the deadliest aspects of mercantilism. But it's based on this idea of having only very limited resources. So if they're going to grab this many Africans, we have to grab this many Africans because we're talking about a competitive notion with basically diminishing returns at the end of it. And so the slave trade is this extremely old trade in North Africa, and the Europeans come across it mostly for the first time. It's not exactly the first time, but close to it in 1444. So in the year 1444, the Portuguese become really taken with this idea of enslaving people, and so they take the first African, they're the first Europeans to take the first Africans and enslave them. But they can only really enslave them. This is where I hope the map kind of makes sense. They can only really enslave the coasts. Now, there are a lot of reasons for this. And that whole, if you see there on the west coast of Africa, that is the major slave coast, what we call the slave coast, right? I have that as one of your terms there, but the slave coast is there. Notice on that map, they are not taking blacks from the interior of Africa at all. It's strictly from the coastline. Anybody know why that's the case? There's a, yeah, Tom, thanks. Well, isn't it that um, tribes would like raid and enslave other tribes and then bring them to the coast? To Absolutely. Uh, that's, there, so there are really two big reasons for this. So number one, most of the tribes right on the coast are allied with the Europeans. And so they willingly capture other Africans and sell them into slavery. Okay, that's part of it. What else? Why, why don't the Europeans, I mean, you think it would be economically beneficial to move into the heart of Africa and set up some kind of base there that would allow for this trade to continue? Kendall? Well, the heart of Africa is scary. Yeah, why? Why is it scary for a European? Well, there's just like a ton of wilderness and there's like animals they haven't seen and the rivers are like super treacherous. Yeah, absolutely. It's called the heart of darkness, right? And it's called that not because the people who live there are dark skinned. It's called that because this is a terrifying place. This is like, this is basically the earthly equivalent of hell is Central Africa. The humidity, the heat, the animals, the insects, the diseases, which Europeans are not accustomed to at all, all of this prevents the Europeans from going into the interior of Africa until the late 19th century. So it's only been in the last 150 years that Europeans have actually colonized the interior of Africa. They didn't have the medical or the technological ability to do so prior to this. And so these slave coasts are this kind of amalgamation of European civilization and African civilization. And they form an incredibly important part of the slave trade. Now, look at that map again on the first page that I gave you. And I, again, I apologize for its quality. But 
Can you tell, what's this map tell us about where Africans are going? Yeah, tell me your name. Mary Claire. Mary Claire, thanks. Um, they're like mostly going to South America, and also, but like also Central America. Yeah, right, look at that. Almost every, every African is going to Brazil or to the Caribbean. Right? Almost everyone. Now that doesn't, that does not lessen our culpability. It doesn't lessen our guilt in all of this. But only about 5% of Africans enslaved came to North America. Why do you think that's the case? I mean, we, we can say there are ideological reasons. You know, we just, we're going to argue here in a moment that everybody has life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that kind of takes down slavery pretty quickly. But what's another reason? Yeah. Tell me your name. Paul. Paul, that's right. <laughs> uh, Thanks. It's just cheaper for them to transport them a shorter distance than it is a long distance. That is a much shorter distance. Right, which we don't often think of. I mean, if you look, if we went straight south from Michigan, we would barely touch the extreme western coast of Latin America. Right? We don't realize how, how farther east Latin America is from us. So it's much cheaper. There's another reason as well. They're more in proximity to each other. What, what also is in proximity? You guys really have to think about this for a moment. Yeah, I hope. Feel like in, in those areas, actual like mass production, like mass farming was more of a thing than in... What like kind of farming? Like sugar and, and tobacco farming. <laughs> okay. Not so much in North America quite yet. What, what would a sugar plantation in western Massachusetts be like? Probably wouldn't really exist. It'd be a total failure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. What if I took a nice 40-acre Massachusetts farm and I put it in the middle of the swamps of South Carolina? How well would it do there? It would not do well. It absolutely matters what your landscape is like and what your environment and your climate are like. One of the reasons, and I want you to just think about this for a moment, would the Europeans have gladly taken over the whole world if they could have? Sure they would have. They would have taken over everything. Think about where the English go. They go to New Zealand. They go to Australia. They go to North America. They go to India. They go to China. Wait a minute. Something should just have hit you. North America looks very English, doesn't it? Our farms, our language, our methods. What happened in China? Why weren't the English successful there? Yeah, Paul. They were all kicked out by the Chinese. Yeah, what could the Chinese do that the English were not capable of? And the same thing in India. Why doesn't India look like England? Every other place they do. I mean, we don't walk into a village here in, in Michigan and think it's going to look like an Ojibwa village. We don't think, oh, Pontiac once lived here, therefore it's going to look just like the Ottawa's. But you walk into an Indian town today, it's dominated by Hindi as a language, the people are Indian. What happened? What's the difference? The difference is wherever the English can practice their agricultural methods, they can remake the world in their image. They can't do that in India. They can't do it in Singapore. They can't do it in China. They can't do it in Central Latin America. It's not possible. And so this is one of the major differences between what we call a frontier and what we call an empire. A frontier is remade in English style. An empire can only have English control over a native style. Does that make sense for everyone? And I, I, don't, want, I, I don't want to make it sound like the environment absolutely determines what we do. But, you know, if I came in a little bit ago with my scarf and my big parka, if I showed up in Houston right now wearing that, that might be a little absurd, right? Whereas if a Houstonian showed up in Michigan at the moment in you know, sandals and, and shorts and a t-shirt, that might be kind of absurd as well. Right? Environment does matter. It matters a lot. It's not, it doesn't shape it, but it does help determine to a certain degree the way that we're going to react. 
So the English only remake the world where the environment is like their own. Even, uh, I know there's at least, Brian, aren't you from Nebraska? No. Oh, you're not? I'm from Michigan. You're from Michigan. Anybody in here from Nebraska? You have any, anyone from the Great Plains at all? Okay. Well, even there, English agriculture doesn't work. It took the Russians to come uh, and to settle in central parts of the U.S. to show how to take that. So just think that the, what we have with the environment does matter, and it shapes things. So that being said, where are black slaves going to be most efficient, to use terrible terminology? They're going to be efficient in environments that are equal to their environment back home. They're going to be best in hot, humid climates, where the English aren't that good. So that's part of what ha is happening with slavery. Now, in 1669, and we don't know exactly what happens, but in 1669, over about two years, what we call chattel slavery starts. That is, families become enslaved. And all those people who were being freed are suddenly no longer being freed. And we don't know exactly what happens. A series of laws are passed between 1669 and 1671 that forbid the actual freeing of, of your Africans, right? which is incredible. So there's this moment. And then we'll see that that slave trade increases dramatically all the way up until about 1761. So for 100 years, right, we see these laws change. And we see it becoming increasingly distressing. OK, now turn the page under the back there where we've got the diagrams. This is the hardest part of the lecture because we have to kind of understand what's going on here. There is absolutely no way to sugarcoat this history. It is a horrible, horrible history. It is an absolutely tragic moment in terms of being human in every way. This is wretched. I don't know if you can tell here because of the, the way the printer worked, but I hope you can, the way that slaves are laid out in these slave ships. And the whole trip from the old world to the new world is called the passage. And what they would often do, they would have hundreds of people that they captured and I, I don't know if you can tell on this, but they divide it between women, boys, and men in the way that they have this. But basically, they just put people in these huge cages under the decks of these ships. There is hardly any kind of ventilation. There is no sanitary conditions in terms of you, know, you don't get a break to go to the toilet. When you're in these slave ships, you are cramped, and the, the trip can take anywhere from four to nine weeks on these ships. You're cramped next to everybody. There's hardly any movement at all. And you can imagine how sick people could get. We know that about one out of every seven slaves dies en route. A lot depends. I mean, this is one reason. I mean, who, who are you going to take if you're a slave trader? Who do you generally pick when you're, when you're transporting? Paul. The healthiest slaves. Yeah, almost always the healthiest young male, right, is what you're going to take. And so that means you're going to have a higher survival rate than if you just have the general population, but you still have a very low survival rate. So here's one doctor describing this. Some wet and blowing weather having occasioned the portholes to be shut and the grating to be covered, fluxes and fevers among the Negroes ensued. While they were in this situation, I frequently went down among them till at length their rooms became so extremely hot as to be bearable for only a very short time. Well, lucky this guy. Uh, he can leave. Nobody else gets to leave. The doctor gets to leave. The floor of the rooms was so covered with blood and mucus, which had proceeded from the consequence of the flux, that it resembled a slaughterhouse. Now, think about how much we complain when someone sits in the middle seat on an airplane. And we're there for three hours, and the guy's got big elbows, and he keeps elbowing us. This can go on for four to nine weeks where you're standing in blood and mucus. You can barely move. You can barely breathe. The food that is given to you is just shared equally, basically first come, first serve. 
all in here. This is horrible. This is hell. In every way, this is hell. And that's what these people had to endure on this passage, going from Africa to the New World. And there's something even worse about this than just the physical conditions. How many of these people do you think know each other when they're on these decks together? These are Africans taken from all different tribes. They have different gods. They have different languages. They have different cultural customs. In other words, we don't just strip them of their humanity physically. We strip them of their inheritance. Now, it, it's a reason, and now things have changed because of you know, 23andMe and all the DNA stuff we can do. But up until about 20 years ago, if you were of African descent, you knew you were of African descent. That was it. Right? You know you're black. But almost anyone who's not, anyone who comes from European stock, we know, well, my grandmother came from Germany. They came from this village. We know all of that. That's all taken away from blacks. Right? There's no inheritance it's like starting over completely here in the new world. So that's the deadliest, con- to me, that's the worst aspect of all of this. Not that the physical stuff isn't horrific, but this idea of actually taking down the culture is equally bad. Uh, and that, that's going to have huge consequences for us. So the slave trade is a serious thing that lasts until about 1761. And then we get to this period between, and you can see that on my timeline back on the first page, from 1761 until 1793, we're suddenly in North America, throughout the colonies, even in places like Georgia and South Carolina, people start freeing their slaves. They start manumitting them. Sometimes it's illegal to do so, but they do it anyway. So manumission is the term for when you take someone out of slavery. To manumit is to take them out of slavery. I don't think I gave you that as a term, but it's definitely a a word you guys should know. So manumission occurs. Why do you think that's the case? Look at those dates, 1761 to 1793. Why, and, and we know that at least one out of every three slaves is freed. And in some areas, one out of every two. That's a huge decrease in slavery. Anyone want to take a guess why? Environment doesn't change, does it? Yeah. Because it's near the road. Oh, oh, your name. Um, now, I've got it wrong. It's Alex. I was going to call you Agnes. <laughs> Alex. Okay, Alex. Thank you. Is it Yeah, that's absolutely it, right? You really can't pass a declaration that says all men are created equal and yet keep people enslaved. And that, it goes against the conscience of these people. They recognize they cannot defend the rights of humanity at the same time that they're doing this. And of course, think about this just logically. The moment the declaration is passed, what has to happen to slavery? What has to happen? There's no way around it. It has to end. It may not end tomorrow, and it may not end next week, but it has to end. You cannot have a declaration that says all men are created equal. There's no asterisk. It doesn't say all men except those from Africa or those with dark skin or those who are Lutheran or those who are Jewish. It doesn't have any of that. There's no asterisk there. All men are created equal endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You can't keep enslavement at that point. It's done. Now, it's going to take 100 years, and that's an insanity in and of itself. But it is done. And that's why, at the beginning of this talk, I said, I love the founding, but it obviously has its problems. But it also has built into it its own solutions. But they take a while. And... That's a a tragic while, but they take a while. And then we get this guy. I don't know how many of you are that familiar with him. He's a great, great guy. He's an undergraduate at Yale by the name of Eli Whitney. He is a devout evangelical Christian. He's been heavily influenced by the First Great Awakening. And he spends his summer working with slaves in the South, and he sees how terrible their labor is. Sometimes 12, 14-hour days of just back-breaking work, picking cotton, 
Okay, I gotta ask you guys again. Anybody, or ask you, comma, again. Has anybody in here ever picked cotton? Any of you from farms? Just out of curiosity. No, you're not, okay. This is, this is such a change from when I was a kid. But anyway, cotton is this fascinating thing because it grows in these huge, what are called bowls, B-O-L-L, -L, and it's the same term you use for if you smoke a pipe, it's the bowl. And you have a bowl, and what you do is you have to peel off the layers, the hard layers, and in between, you've got, the, it's yellow, it's not white like we think of it because it's been bleached when we get it. But the cotton is yellow, and within the bowl, the cotton, very intricately torn, has about a thousand seeds each. In each one of these bowls, there's about a thousand seeds. Prior to Eli Whitney, all of this had to be taken down by hand. So you'd break the bowl, and then you would take one seed out, another seed out, another seed, until you got all thousand out. And then you would take the cotton, and you would ship it off and bleach it and process it. And it was an extremely complex labor. And so a really fit slave working, say, 12 hours, which is outrageous anyway, but working, say, a 12-hour day could produce about one pound of cotton a day. Just think about how light cotton is. That's actually pretty high human productivity. I mean, think about what you have to go through to get that, to get one pound of cotton. What Eli Whitney's machine does is it takes the bowl of cotton with rotating teeth and it breaks open the hard shell and pulls it apart in such a way that most of the seeds fall out. It's all meant to make blacks have an easier day at labor. This is his goal. He's a devout Christian. But what it does is it means that the average slave goes from being able to produce one pound of cotton a day to producing 1,000 pounds of cotton a day. It's one of the greatest increases in human productivity ever in our history. Well, what does this do for slavery? Yeah, Paul. Uh, instead of having the desired effect where it decreases the amount of slaves bought, the slave owners realize they can be much more productive by buying much more slaves. Absolutely. Think about your productivity now. So the whole purpose of the cotton gin was to help black slaves not be so burdened, and exactly the opposite happens. Now, because it's so cheap to produce cotton, not only are they going to buy more and more slaves, excuse me, but they're going to keep expanding westward and creating new land to grow the cotton on. It's now worth it. It wasn't before. Slavery was dying. Slavery was dying because people knew that it was immoral and also because it was no longer efficient. Now in 1793, it becomes wildly, wildly productive in terms of what it can do, at least in the cotton trade. So we have this really weird thing in American history. And even though I've taught this now for 23 years, it's still hard for me to teach because it's so hard, I think, to understand, at least for me. But we have this really weird thing happen. Think about the date, 1793. What's happened at that point in terms of the founding? Declaration passed. Northwest Ordinance is passed. Constitution's passed. Bill of Rights is passed. In other words, for all intents and purposes, the founding's done. In the North, you have a situation in which most Americans believe with the Northwest Ordinance, slavery is done. They don't actually think it's over, but they think it will be over very soon. It's dying out. It's going to end. Whereas in the South, what do you have? You have this radical increase in production and the number of slaves skyrockets. So I told you just a little bit ago that between 1761 and 1793, slavery decreases anywhere from 33 to 50%. Immediately in the years following 1793, it increases 400%. And it won't stop until 16, uh, and excuse me, until 1861, right? It won't stop. So what you have, and this is the hard part to explain, is that you have an America that is northern and free, and an America that is southern and enslaved, and they don't get each other at all. Not only do they have different ways of thinking, but they have radically different labor systems. And we would think, well, how could they not know this? 
Well, most newspapers are regional. Most people travel only, because travel is so expensive, only within their own sphere. You don't have a lot of people going north and south, except for the merchants, and they're all making money, so they're not going to complain about this. And you see this huge division between a northern culture and a southern culture that will only grow and grow and grow. So that, and this is a little bit out of our time frame, but by the time you get to 1819, not that far into the future, but by the time you get to 1819, Missouri is ready to come in as a state, and it wants to come in as a slave state. Well, northerners are just shocked. I mean, this institution's still around? Those three compromises in the Constitution were for you to get rid of that, not, not to make it stronger. And the southerners say, what do you mean? You're that blind that you don't know for the last generation we have lived on slave labor? You were that blind to who and what we are? And you don't have to know these names, but the two leaders of the debate in 1819, 1820, one is a Marylander by the name of William Pickney, and he says, I was at the Constitutional Convention. I know for certain those three compromises were to protect the institution of slavery. And on the other side, you have a guy from New York named Rufus King, and King says, I was at the Constitutional Convention, and I know that those three compromises were made to destroy slavery. They're both right, and yet they both can't be. But they were both there in the constitutional debates. So this is one of those things that no matter how often we try and get right, we mess it up time and time and time again. And it really won't be until the Civil War that you're able to take down this institution. Uh, but it, it's going to have a long history to it, very long. Okay, any questions on any of that? I hope that gives you at least a context for what's going on. Right, anyone going to be deeply offended if we end two minutes early? All right, thanks, everybody. Good. I'll see you on Wednesday, and do keep up with the reading.